Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome back once again to our ongoing series on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Nama Om Vishnipadaya Krishna Pashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharane Nivishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarane All glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. So we are continuing with our mini series on stimulation for ecstatic love, and this will be part 64. For this lecture, I would like to discuss how transcendental devotional poetry serves to awaken our love for Radha and Krishna and everything connected to them. I was really waiting to deliver this, this lecture, a lot of nectar. To begin, <coughs> to set the groundwork, let us give the uh, Webster's Dictionary, it's a popular dictionary in the West, um, its definition of worldly poetry. And I quote here, writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience in language chosen and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhyme is called poetry. But unlike worldly poetry, which of course deals with the affairs of this temporary world, Krishna conscious poetry is known as Uttamakavya, Uttamakavya, which literally means first class poetry because it deals with Krishna's name, fame, form, pastimes, etc. It also creates a quote, specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhyme, like we heard Webster's dictionary describe, but um, in a purely spiritual, devotional way. Therefore, therefore, such poetry is also referred to as Bhakti Bhardhani Mahishi. Bhakti Bhardhani Mahishi, meaning the queen of increasing unalloyed devotion. Now, a Vrindavan scholar named Madhava Das um, of the late 17th century, he wrote very nicely. I, I found this in the Vrindavan Research Institute. He wrote as follows. Such poetry repairs the broken hearts of devotees. It quenches the thirst of separation from great souls. It makes everyone laugh. It makes everyone cry. It heals the wounds of Maya's victims and increases love for Krishna. It is capable of doing this and all more. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur writes in his Braj Riti Chintamani, um, verse one, I believe, or part one, <laughs> Vrindavan related poetry is actual poetry among all varieties of poetry. Along with its permanent everlasting rasas, such poetry is the soul of all other poetry, due to which all other poetry and their temporary shadow-like rasas sustain their existence. That Vrindavan-related poetry is indeed truly worthy of being called poetry. May such exclusive Vrindavan-related poetry, which is the essence of all poetry, be my topmost poetry. Hare Krishna. Now, Srila Rupa Goswami states that any writings, poetry or prose or any writing specifically about Radha and Krishna are like Sikarini. It's a cooling preparation known today as Srikanda. In that regard, he composed a verse in the introduction to his Vidagda Madhava Natakam as follows. The Srikarini drink of Sri Hari's pastimes is capable of defeating the joyous sweetness of the moon's nectar. It is also fragrant due to the cooling camphor of Sri Radha's love. May this Sri Karini drink drive away all of your thirst caused by walking on the difficult, troublesome pathways of the material world. Now I found a verse in the Agni Purana 3363 that reaffirms that Krishna conscious poetry is topmost because it awakens bhakti or divine love 
within the heart for Radha and Krishna. Dharatvam durlabham loke vidya tatra sadurlabha kavitvam durlabham tatra shakti satatra sadurlabha Quote, in this material world, a human birth is very rare. And amongst humans, wisdom is rarer still. Amongst the scholars of wisdom, poetry is even more rare. But amongst the poets, the poetry which melts the heart with its rasa is the rarest. <laughs> and by Prabhupada's grace, we have access to this rare poetry about devotional service to Krishna. Gorkashur Das Babaji was once asked uh, how to achieve love of God. He replied, it only costs five anas. His audience uh, couldn't understand what he meant, so he elaborated. He said, go to the market and purchase Naratam Das Thakur's Partana and Prem Bhakti Chandrika for five anas. If you read and meditate on those poetic books daily, he will develop love for Krishna. An example of Srila Naratam Das Thakur's simple devotional Bengali poetry is in, uh, from one of his songs in Partana. We'll just quote one line, it's enough. Golokera Prem Dhan Harinam Shankirtan. The treasure house of divine love in Goloka Vrindavan has descended as the congregational chanting of Lord Hari's holy names, poetry in its essence. Now, <coughs> in preparation for this lecture, it became very apparent to me that poems are uh, a very, very prominent part of our Gaudiya Vaishnav history. Our tradition of poetry actually goes back, you could say, more than a thousand years. And here are some, not all of course, but some of the names of our most prominent poets through the ages. Uh, of course, I can't mention them all again, but just by hearing these names, Cheto Dharpa Namarjana, we feel our heart becoming purified. Jayadev Goswami, Vidyapati Das, Chandi Das, Chandrasekhar Kaviraj, Rai Ramananda, Gadadhar Pandit, Balaba Das, Gopal Kavi, Govinda Kaviraj, Vasudev Ghosh, Nityananda Das, Jagadananda Pandit, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, Narahari Chakravarti, Srinath Chakravarti, uh, Raghava Pandit, Srinivas Thakur, Narottam Das Thakur, Shamananda Pandit, Vishwanath Chakravarti, Rasikananda Goswami, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and our own beloved Sridhar Prabhupada. What a list of names. They're all great poets. And as you can guess from that list of names, poetry played a very important role during the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago. The illustrious uh, Vaishnav Das, this poet from Vrindavan, describes that as follows. It's really nice. May the art of poetry of Vaishnavas be victorious. It rules over the heart of one and all manifests everyone's desires and showers everyone in bliss. May the darling son of Mother Sachi, Shigora Natavara, be victorious. He places his left arm on the shoulder of Rai Ramananda, his right arm on the shoulder of Shrub Dhamadar, and listens to the splendid and deeply meaningful poems of Vidyapachi, Chandidash, and Jayadev Goshai. Vaishnav Das says, when will that day come when I will compose uncountable poems to satisfy the hearts of devotees and become known as Shi Gora Sharan, a soul who took shelter under Gorhari's lotus feet. Shi Gora Sharan, what a name. Now, in Vrindavan, I was reading, scholars say that there are three different categories of exalted Krishna conscious poets. They are Lila Smriti poets, Anubhavi Darshan poets, and 
Anugraha poets. The Leela uh, Smriti poets are those who are present with Krishna and uh, participate in his pastimes. It's described they appear in Kali Yuga on the earth during Lord, Mahap Lord Chaitanya's pastimes to write about the essence of those pastimes. And whatever they write, their poems come from their memory of whatever they've seen. <laughs> the second type of poets are Anu Bhavi Darshan. These are uh, pure devotees who are capable of seeing the Lord's ever uh, ongoing pastimes in his uppercut, meaning unmanifested leelas, in Shivandavan Dham. They see with spiritual vision and they write poems for us. The third type of poets, Anugraha, are poets who, by the mercy of their guru and their sincere practices in devotional service, become exalted and then write poems about pure devotion and its loving moods. So three categories of poets. I thought that was interesting to share. But in reality, all Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis are meant to become poets, all of us. In a lecture on June 6, 1969, Sridhar Prabhupada said to the uh, assembled devotees, for the Vaishnava, there is one qualification, become poetic. You should all, everyone, should become poetic. But that poetry, that poetry language, should be simply to glorify the Lord. And while recording, that famous recording Prabhupada did of Paramakaruna, which we often hear, <coughs> at, one, at one point Prabhupada said, <coughs> Practically all Vaishnavas, they are transcendentally poetic. This is one of the 26 qualifications of the Vaishnava to become a poet. And actually I was thinking becoming true poets in Krishna consciousness will help us to win the hearts of the mass of people, prospective devotees. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Anchi Lila 1, verse 195, we hear very famous verse about poetry. Kim kavyena kavesh tasya, kim kandhena donush mata, parasya hridaye lagnam, nagur nayati yachitira. What is the use of a bowman's arrow or a poet's poetry if they penetrate the heart but do not cause the head to spin? So important, let me recite that again. What is the use of a bowman's arrow or a poet's poetry if they penetrate the heart but do not cause the head to spin? <laughs> Actually, I went deeper into that and the origin of that verse is in Nala Champu 1.5 by an ancient poet named Trivikaram Bhatta. We thank him from afar. Now Trivikaram Bhatta again is a poet from the distant past. And I was reading that, again, in preparation for this lecture, that different poets in the past have highlighted different aspects of poetry. We're getting a little technical here, but it needs to be said. <laughs> They've highlighted different aspects of poetry. Some poets say that true poetry lies in the meaning of the words. Other poets say that true poetry is in the ras, in the devotional mellow or the, or the experience that one has from hearing that poetry. Some poets say that true poetry is the literary ornaments, uh, the figures of speech that decorate the poetry like rhyme, etc. Other poets say that true poetry is the various qualities or gunas of the poetry. For example, some poetry may elicit a, a mellow in your heart with very soft syllables, and others use very harsh syllables to bring forth spiritual emotion like that. So it's quite deep. <laughs> but here's something even deeper. Sri Kavikarnapura, in his Alankara Kushtuba, chapter one, writes that Kavya, poetry, is a living person. Wow. Kavya poetry, transcendental poetry, is a living person. 
And he composes the following verse in that scripture to describe what he calls the Kavya Purusha, or poetry personified. I'll recite it very slowly. <coughs> he writes, personified poetry, Kavya Purusha, has his body made out of words and their meanings. Divanvi, suggestion, is his life air. Rasa is his soul. Gunas, poetic excellences, are present in him. He is decorated externally with alankars, or literary ornaments. Then he says, some faults may be present in him, but they are to be neglected. Now, initially, I thought it odd <laughs> that Kavi Konopona wrote that this personified personality of poetry, Kavya Purusha, may have some faults present in him, but they're to be neglected. But then I remembered the Srimad, the Srimad Bhagavatam verse, 1511, and Srila Prabhupada's purport therein, which clarified the matter for me. So the verse, many of you know, on the other hand, that literature which is full of descriptions of the transcendental glories of the name, fame, form, pastimes, etc., of the unlimited Lord is a different creation, full of transcendental words directed toward bringing about a revolution in the impious lives of this world's misdirected civilization. Such transcendental literatures, even though imperfectly composed, are heard, sung, and accepted by purified men who are thoroughly honest. And in the purport, of course, <laughs> Prabhupada just reveals everything. In the purport, Prabhupada elaborates. He writes, Our presenting this matter, Krishna consciousness, in adequate language, especially a foreign language, will certainly fail, and there will be so many literary discrepancies, despite our honest attempt to present it in the proper way. But we are sure that with all our faults in this connection, the seriousness of the subject matter will be taken into consideration and the leaders of society will still accept this due to its being an honest attempt to glorify the Almighty God. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Now, there is one poet whom we haven't mentioned. Actually, I was saving his name, saving him and, and his leelas, and that is Biva Mangala Thakur. Biva Mangala's incomparable poetry, including his magnum opus, Krishna Karnamrita, actually won him the name Leela Sukha. Now, Biva Mangal depicted love in separation in such verses as follows. <coughs> O my Lord, O friend of the helpless, you are the only ocean of mercy. Because I have not met you, my inauspicious days and nights have become unbearable. I do not know how I shall pass the time. Now, Krishna eventually rewarded Bhivamongal Thakur's loving devotion by granting him direct vision of himself, which actually assured Bhivamongal's entrance into the spiritual world at death. But it's very interesting that Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami's commentary on the final verses of Krishna Karnamrita take the form of a dialogue between Biva Mangala and Krishna, who has just revealed himself along with Srimati Radharani to Biva Mangala Thakur. And Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami describes Biva Mangal's ecstatic with bliss upon seeing the Lord, but because of that ecstasy, for whatever reason, he can't properly describe Krishna. He's just like overwhelmed. So he called the Lord an indescribable mass of bliss. Lord, you're an indescribable mass of bliss. So Krishna said, Biva Mangal, I want to hear about that sweetness. Please describe it. So Biva Mangal responded, I can only offer respect to that ocean of sweetness because it's beyond words. So Krishna continued to tease him. He said, Biva Mangal, if words cannot describe it, use your mind to envision it. 
So again, Biva Mongol excused himself. He said, my Lord, your sweetness is beyond thought as much as it is beyond words. So Krishna replied, <laughs> if something cannot be expressed by words or thought, how can it be perceived, Bhiva Mongol? So Bhiva Mongol Thakur said, Lord, your sweetness reveals itself to those whose hearts are overcome with the mood of loving you, which arises from having envisioned you, which in turn causes a longing to see you directly. So at that point, Krishna changed the subject. And he said, by calling me a mass of bliss, are you saying that I am the impersonal Brahman? So Leela Sukha, we'll say here. Leela Sukha smiled and said, no, Lord, you are the brilliant sapphire ornament of Gokula, whom I adore. You are the brilliant sapphire ornament of Gokul, whom I adore. So pleased with this devotee, Krishna said, if a Mongol, this book of yours, Krishna Karnamrita, is such nectar for my ears that I stand before you to offer you a boon. Please make a request. What else do you desire besides seeing me and my beloved, uh, Sri Radha? So Bhiva Mongol, he paused for a moment and he said, O Krishna Deva, for the next hundred days of Brahma, may this book, which is nectar for your ears, flood the hearts of those who are devoted to you. So Krishna fulfilled Bhiva Mongol Thakur's desire by saying, so be it. And then he spontaneously offered another benediction. He said to Bhiva Mongol, your book will be dear not only to devotees in general, but also to experts in devotion, even to my gopis. I like that part, even to my gopis. Then the Bhiva Mongol Thakur, filled with wonder that such a, how could you say, august audience would relish his book, he thought something Simple but sweet. He thought, how astonishing. How astonishing. Elegance is truth spoken concisely. Then Krishna tested him. He said, devotees will be attracted by your unprecedented poetry, Leela Sukha. Devotees will be attracted by your unprecedented poetry. And Biva Mongol, he shook his head and he said, you asked me to make a request. And so again I beg. Poetry aside, let devotees taste the fragrance of your sweetness as it is glorified in this book. And then Kaviraj Goswami, he says the Lord clapped his hands. <laughs> now sometimes I've heard devotees say, you know, when the kirtan's over, we shouldn't clap our hands. We should, we should, say, <laughs> we should just say, Hari Bol, but here the Lord clapped his hands in, in pleasure. And he exclaimed, Lila Sukha, you have purchased me with your compassion for others and your love for me. You have come to Braja, and now you should taste it. And now you should taste it. Wow. Of course, our very own Sridhar Pawapad was a masterful poet in his own right, in every right. It is his poems that Parashur Hridaye Lagnam Nagur Nayati Yachtira penetrated our hearts and caused our heads to spin as that verse we quoted earlier on in the lecture. So I thought it would be most appropriate today to finish with one of Sridhar Prabhupada's poems, the one that touches everyone's heart all the time when we read it is the following. It's actually a Vyasa Puja offering Prabhupada wrote to his own spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was so touched by this particular poem that he had it printed in uh, the Gaudiya Math magazine, The Harmonist, Prabhupada's offering to his Guru Maharaj. Now, the original copy, uh, I believe it was actually typed out by Sridhar Prabhupada, was lost for many years, until one day in the 1970s, when Prabhupada was still present with us, devotees were cleaning uh, Prabhupada's rooms uh, at the Radhadambadar temple in Vrindavan, and found in one of Sridhar Prabhupada's old trunks the offering. It was tucked away, you know, folded and tucked away somewhere. So when they told Sridhar Prabhupada they had found it, 
He was very happy. And he ordered it to be printed in Back to Godhead magazine. <laughs> like his Guru Maharaj had, had ordered it to be printed in the Harmonist, he ordered it to be printed in Back to Godhead magazine for our benefit. Let us finish today with the poetry of our beloved Srila Prabhupada. Adore ye, adore ye all, the happy day, blessed than heaven, sweeter than May, when he appeared at Puri, the holy place, my Lord and Master, his divine grace. O my Master, the evangelic angel, give us thy light, light up thy candle. Struggle for existence, a human race, the only hope, his divine grace. Misled we are, O going astray, save us, Lord, our fervent prey. Wonder thy ways to turn our face, adore thy feet, your divine grace. Forgotten Krishna, we've fallen souls, paying most heavy the illusions toll. Darkness around all untrace, the only hope, his divine grace. Message of service thou hast brought, a healthful life as Chaitanya wrought, unknown to all, it's full of brace, that's your gift, your divine grace. Absolute is sentient, thou hast proved, in personal calamity, thou hast moved. This gives us a life anew and fresh. Worship thy feet, your divine grace. Had you not come, who had told the message of Krishna, forceful and bold? That's your right, you have the mace, save me of fallen, your divine grace. The line of service, as drawn by you, is pleasing and healthy, like morning dew. The oldest of all, but in new dress, miracle done, your divine grace. Hare Krishna. There's nothing more to be said, Prabhu. Thank you so much. And um, I'm in Surat, Gujarat right now. We're continuing with our tour of India with a small group. And um, be back next um, next Friday. Hare Krishna. Shishi Gorani Thai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radhasama Sundar Ki, Vrindavaneshwari Srimati Radharani Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Gauri Thai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yagya Ki, Nitai Gaur Pimanandi, Jay Jay Sisirad Shine, Glories to Shri